I think inflation is probably our biggest risk right now. Um, there's a lot of controllable things. And then uh, that to me is the uncontrollable one. I think what I would cite is just the demand and the same challenges that we're having, every developer is having, and it's it's just slowing down building. Right. Um, and it, it's just creating more and more demands. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Josh Eidengon is the co-founder of DXE Properties, a real estate investment company. He focuses on acquisitions and business optimization. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Pleasure's mine. Three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me, where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Started 2012, um, roundabout way, but I, I, I'm out of New York, was introduced to a property manager in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we liked each other. He ended up sort of being my boots on the ground, found a interesting short sale opportunity $175,000. I uh, syndicated 20 units in uh, it was a suburb of Cincinnati. That was basically my first deal. It was uh, held for like a year and a half. The property management did the renovation oversight and uh, maybe we sold it. I don't know. Yeah, it was probably less than a year and a half later. And I was, I was hooked. Um, so that was 2012. At that time, I was working for a software company was like, oh, real estate's the best thing ever. So I, I was committed in my mind to get over to the real estate side. I, I stayed with that software company for another year or two, left to work for an investment company as an acquisitions guy slash analyst, learned a lot there, was really on the ground and was able to touch a lot of different parts of that business. Ultimately peeled away from them after five or six years, really, I think, better learning and understanding it. And um, co-founded DXE Properties with my current partner, um, Donato. And uh, our, our most recent project is actually, uh, it's a big deal. It's $180 million development in Seattle. We're building um, 410 multifamily units on top of retail. Um, there's a lot in between, but uh, th that's the, the then to now in terms of uh, where we started and where we are today. Wow. Let's talk about that first deal for a quick second. You indi you indicated that you syndicated that deal. What I mean, how do you even, how does a $175,000 deal support even the document preparation for a syndication? I don't know that it totally did. Um, so, <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of takeaways, but um, a lot of the things I had going for me at the time, well, one timing of the market so I, I i didn't even know enough to know how good my timing was then um but i did raise money for that deal in the form of promissory notes so it wasn't really a syndication necessarily um, but that allowed the economics to make a little bit more sense um so that i paid everyone nine percent and then was able to realize the upside on my own um it's difficult like you're alluding to to really syndicate a deal of that size and there'd be anything left in it Right, right, absolutely. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Let's move on uh, from that, and let's talk about your five or six years spent as an acquisitions slash analyst. What would you recommend that path to someone? Yes, enormously. Um, I there's no way we would have been able to scale the way we did um, and have done as a company had I not had that background and direct experience. Um, not just learning like the uh, called the numbers side of it or the mechanics side of it, but really just understanding the relationship building, the people nurturing, cultivation part of the business. Um, that was really the fuel to allow, I, I think, us to to go. Um, you know, it, it's it's different. Everyone's starting at a different point in their life. I was twenty five or twenty six, saying, "Let's make a career change." No kids, no wife at the time. So it's easier for me to do that and take that path. But I, I think if you're younger getting into the business, the more traditional path, I think, while it could take time and maybe be frustrating that way, really arms you to do a lot more later, I think. What were some things that you saw that um, you said, hey, we're not going to repeat that when I go out on my own? You know, it's probably deal profile. And that's taken some time. It's not that first deal that that made me realize, hey, this this works. But I, I think getting outside of um, 
call it the rougher C class space and getting enamored by higher cap rate deals that on, on paper make more sense. Um, you know, I, I think we, like a lot of syndicators, have been uh, by saved by some of the market, maybe getting into some rougher deals and, and coming out, you know, with a big smile on the other side. Um, but I think now when we're still buyers at the end of the day, and we're going to try to be buyers, even though it's ultra competitive, we want to chase quality and, and a story behind that quality. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So you think, if I'm hearing you right, is that the people holding or buying rougher C, C minus D class properties are taking on more risk maybe than what they were seven, eight years ago? Certainly. And we're, I mean, we're in different markets, you and I, uh, but still, I, I to buy a, a low three cap C class deal to maybe take it to a operated out of five, which is probably optimistic these days. Right. There's no way I want to take that risk on that profile deal. And we saw it from COVID, not to say we're going to have that same outbreak or whatever, but that that flash dramatically impacted those, you know, those that profile of tenant base in terms of service workers losing their job very quickly, um, often being week to week, month to month type um, tenants. Those are the ones that were impacted, whereas um, I, I think even a, a, a slight step above was much better insulated to weather a storm or a, a, a blip. Right. Right. How do you feel uh, on the other end of the spectrum? You guys are building brand new. Uh, what was that? That was that was uh, 200 or 410 units of multifamily on top of retail. I mean, development has its own inherent risks as well. How do you feel like when you contrast those two, how and, and why do you feel like what you're doing is a safer bet? I'm nervous about it. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, but I'm nervous about everything these days. I don't. I don't think you can. I don't think you should be buying anything and not be nervous about it at any point in time. <laughs> it's probably healthy. Right. Um, so it's concerning. I think inflation's probably our biggest risk right now. Um, there's a lot of controllable things, and then uh, that to me is the uncontrollable one. I think what I would cite. It's just the demand and the same challenges that we're having, every developer's having, and it's it's just slowing down building. Right. Um, and it, it's just creating more and more demand. So this was a deal that likely we would not be doing were it not for the story, where um, it's something that we've been working on for years and years. We sort of made a bit of like a land bank type of play and I think got lucky with the land that we do own and are developing on. Generally, I, I think Development, while it definitely carries higher risks, we are pursuing more development than we have in the past because we we have the conversation with ourselves about just replacement costs. And right. it, it, if you're buying a B-class deal for 180, 200 something a door, and you could build it for 200 something a door, it makes you scratch your head. Um, so I, as much as I realize the risks, we're, we are being pulled that way more and more right now. Talk to us about the story behind this, if you can, behind this deal. In Seattle? Mm -hmm. Sure. So this was, um, do you know Seattle? Familiar with Seattle? Uh, roughly. Okay. So um, Seattle, a big push for them has been like a light rail expansion project. So it, it started down at the airport, continuing into downtown. Then it sort of spread off from there, east, west, north. Um the North Light Rail has been trying to get traction for a long time in terms of its approval. Mm. Um, finally, in the last few years, it was approved, um, but they received state funding. And we focus on one of the likely approval towns that were, were coming, and we put options. Um, it was a cul-de-sac of eight homes, put above market options to buy these houses that were all like pretty rundown houses um, for, I think they were all a year plus. Um, so it gave us some flexibility to just see what was going to happen. Um, I think we got lucky and, and right as part of it, but they ended up choosing Mount Lake Terrace, our town, um, where the, directly adjacent to our site, which we were hopeful and expecting to happen. Um, and as part of that, they had to up zone that area to really, um, I think, allow for and, and complement the growth that was going to come with the light rail. So 
these single family lots went from single family lots to something that we could build up to 12 stories on. So, I, you know, I think more than anything, as our hedge, our land base is so, so low there that we just uh, feel very comfortable pressing forward, even at this time. How did you, I mean, you guys are in New York. How did you, do you already have a footprint there in Seattle? We do. So um, a good friend of ours who is out of New York also now is from Seattle. So that's what pulled us over there. Admittedly, it's not what we know especially well. When I was on the acquisition side, I, I was all focused in the Southeast. So there's eight or nine cities in the Southeast that I know very well. Um, Seattle, we were we were dragged out to and we were chasing that story. Um, ultimately, we're we're chasing a story um, as, as much as as much as I like to say we're doing anything at a next level. It, it's that's a lot of the value that we bring to us and our investors that the backstory of the deal. Oh, that's true. I think with any of us, you know, there's there's a lot of things I've been involved in that I'm like, wait, how did I get here? Well, it's just because <laughs> right. I called you and said, hey, I've got this interesting deal, you know, in such and such a location. Let me tell you about it. And you're like, oh, actually, that's really that's really smart. I love it. Let, let's go. Right, um, but but without that, without that local knowledge, I, that's what I was getting at. Was like, how are you finding eight homes, rougher homes, and you want to put an options on them? Like, that's a really, really nuanced buy, you know, for a guy living on the other side of the country. No, it, it would not have happened were it not for that. The, the uh, our friend that's out of New York and and his family's in real estate has the ties out there and pulled us out there. But it's difficult, like you know, whether you're starting or trying to take a leap into a new market. It, it is a challenge. I mean, newer, I, way larger companies than us uh, do it all the time. And even for them, they have the same growing pains, breaking into a new market, building the same team and efficiencies and all, all of that. It's a challenge. What's been a mistake that you've made uh, that has either cost you in time or money or both? You know, it's probably it's probably on the property management side, um, maybe being slow to remove a property manager. I, I think now with a little bit more, we've definitely seen that with greater size, you do get a better caliber of managers to choose from. Um, but particularly when I was starting with some of the smaller deals um, and your manager options are are more like the you know small company guy that's that's jumping around from place to place and has a small team and still figuring out himself. Um, I, I think the takeaway was that if you see something going sideways, management-wise, operationally, you're better off pulling the, off the band-aid sooner rather than later, and rather than trying to uh, fix something that might be unfixable. Yeah, that's uh, there's a quote that I've often said, but it's it's hard to implement, right? Because you think you think you can course correct, but, yeah. but, but the quote is all, often when's the when's the right time to fire somebody, and the answer is the first time you think about it. <laughs> that's I, I, it. I've never had that not be true. Like when it comes to staff, when it comes to property managers or something else, it's like, you know, you internally know there's there's a compass somewhere inside of you that goes, this is not working and it's not ever going to work. I like it. Yeah. I'm going to have, I, I might, I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll quote you. I'll cite you every time I use it, but I do like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's kind of a harsh statement. You you know, it's kind of a harsh statement, but it, but it goes hand in hand with that, you know, the time and money mistakes. Like that's, um you know, the first time you thought about it and you probably, you probably were never wrong from that point moving forward until you removed and you're like, oh man, I'm so glad I finally got that done. No, I, I agree. Especially, and especially now when it's like, it's so difficult to find good people that you're like, you're, you're sort of reluctant to remove anyone at any point in time, because it's just, you don't know what you're going to get on the other side of the coin. So it, it, it's a balance in that way. But I, I think uh, with making a change from property manager as a whole, on, on that side, I just say, rip the bandaid and, and reset. And it's it's probably healthy. Very healthy. Yep. Absolutely love it. What? Uh, how are you guys handling your financing right now? We've do everything. Um, we we last year we assumed a HUD loan. Um, we have agency financing, Fannie and Freddie. We have bridge debt, which has been mostly like um, just bank uh, debt fund type bridge debt. We've done local bank financing, so we, we've I think touched it all. We've even done insurance company financing. I, you know, right now I, I think what's most attract. Obviously, rates are going up quickly, um, so that's something to be mindful of. Underwrite for hedge for all of those things. I think that what we've seen in the last year has certainly been that bridge financing has been super aggressive. 
And it it almost precludes going agency, uh, at least for most of the deals that we've looked at, just because of the flexibility to be able to exit from bridge financing versus uh, agency. Is there a type of lending or is there a lending product that you see as risky? I guess historically, you would say bridge financing, even even after I just said how much I like it right now. Um, I think that it's deal profile driven. My argument always for bridge financing is you could exit it. It, It's easy to exit. Whereas in some cases with agency financing, if you have long, long term term and yield maintenance, you know, you might be in a situation where you can exit in two or three years. And if that was bridge, you would be able to exit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could argue sometimes that that what's traditionally thought of as the safest type of financing may not be. Right. Right. Yeah. And certainly in the with the tailwinds that we've experienced uh, here in the last few years, a lot of people have paid a lot of prepayment penalties. And, you know, if they were in a shorter term debt situation that cost them a little bit more on the front end, you know, they've been able to exit and save tens of millions of dollars on prepayment penalties. So it's it, it's a balancing act. Yeah, you know, I don't grant it. It's it's way above my uh, pay grade, but you would think that Fannie or Freddie would try to compete a little more and perhaps lighten their exit penalties or or do something, just make it that much more attractive. I think they could pull back a lot of the bridge business that they've since lost. Right, right, yeah, and that's just the market filling the gap, which is uh, you know what 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 the market should do uh, when there's an inefficiency there. What uh, talk to us a little bit about your team. I mean, building a $180 million development is no small feat, especially across the country. How are you getting that done? Yes. So um, I've obviously mostly talked about myself, but uh, my my partner's background is really strictly development, Uh, mostly high rise development, but this is, it's really exactly what he's done. Um, And he took a, in terms of background and path, he took a much more traditional real estate path. He went to to, uh, well, college as an engineer, then he uh, grad school for real estate development from NYU, and then worked for developers and contractors, um, very all real estate focused, whereas I, I sort of bounced around a little more. So, um, so we are, you know, we've really compiled a team out there to be able to do this. And it's a team of 12 different individuals, but we have a consultant that's directly working for us. That's really our boots on the ground. Um, to facilitate taking it through today through entitlement um, in a way that we can't do as efficiently day to day. However, I will tell you it's it's by far the most time intensive of anything that we're involved in. Um, we are we have two standing calls with full team, which is twenty plus people at this point every week, um, and then on top of that, there's just a lot of weekly activity, and we haven't started. We hope to break ground uh, middle of next year, so. <laughs> Right. Um, so it's time and it's certainly time intensive, but I, I do think this is a project just because of its uniqueness and, and what we're putting together. We're, we're super excited about it. Just elevating us as a company. That is awesome. Absolutely love it. Let's jump, uh, here into a f- last few questions for you. Tell me something that you are curious about. I, I assume you want a real estate centric answer, right? Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, this is the, the, the show is yours, man. No, no. Um, on the, you know, Something I was talking about this morning with my partner here. I'm um, I'm maybe the more optimistic one than than uh, Donato is, but you know he was uh, rattling his mind for what's going to cause the reset. How does how do how do how do prices reset? Um, I don't want to say we're rooting for a crash, but a little little shake up, a little bit of hesitation in the marketplace, we think would be healthy. So that's what I'm very curious about. I have no clue what's what's going to do that. It's probably not something that I could list off. Um, no. But that's that's what I'm scratching my head about right now. Right. Like, do if we have a correction, does it help uh, commodities prices or does it drive them higher? Uh, you know, if it does that, does that reduce demand? If commodities prices fall, and so we're you know, it's now we're worse off than we were before. Who knows? It's uh, <laughs> it's a great thing to be curious about. I love that. What's a good book you're reading right now? The last book. I'm not really reading any good books right now. I've been, uh, I was just gifted a master class. I don't know. Have you heard of those? They're like, yeah. uh, uh-huh. sort of like, yeah. Um, so I'm excited to, to listen to some of those. Um, a book that I always like suggest, which is something I read early on. That's always stuck with me for some reason with um, powerhouse principles. Have you heard of that? 
Mm. It's um, Jorge Perez. He's like the, he was one of the founders of related companies um, down in Miami and was sort of like a, from nothing to building a behemoth company. Um, And it's, it's, it's a combination of high level and also getting in the weeds and a good, easy read. um, If you're looking for a suggestion. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Josh, last question for you. For listeners who want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? The best way is through our website, dxeproperties.com. And you can contact us or schedule time on our calendar. And I'm um, always happy to connect from any perspective, whether it's someone getting started or wants to get involved with us directly or, or just wants to connect. Um, we'd love to do so. Awesome. Josh, thanks for your time today. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Sam.